Good morning. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. It's about a new heaven and a new earth. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The second Bible reading is taken from the New Testament, and it's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 15. There is no need for me to write to you about the service to the Lord's people, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Akachia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For in any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we will not say anything about you. Would be ashamed of having been so conf- confident. So I thought it nece- necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift that you have promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudging, grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, and at all times, having all that you need, you will be abound in every good work, as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed, and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. 
and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, let me pray as we open God's word together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for inspiring all scripture by the Holy Spirit. Help us by your spirit so to hear your holy word that we may be equipped for every good work through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it was a couple of years ago that I came across uh, this lady by the name of Marie Kondo. Has anyone heard of Marie Kondo before? She was suddenly very famous as an organiser, someone who could help you get the clutter out of your house. And she was most famous for one little phrase, this is the measure of whether you should keep or dispose of an object, and this was her catch cry, does it spark joy? Does it spark joy? So apparently you are supposed to pick up the object, uh, look at it, and ask yourself, does it spark joy? And if it doesn't spark joy, you should get rid of it. Does it spark joy? It's a little bit like how the Apostle Paul describes Christian giving. Now, stay with me here. Um, giving isn't duty or drudgery. Giving should spark joy. God loves a cheerful giver, he says in his second letter to the Corinthian Christians. And to the world's way of thinking, that is a bit upside down. The world's way of thinking is that is not that giving sparks joy, but that money sparks joy. Um, Spike Milligan said, money can't buy you happiness, but it does bring a more pleasant form of misery. Uh, hopefully we don't view life quite that darkly. But we know that money can't buy you happiness. Nevertheless, in practice, so many of our friends and neighbours act as if it can. And so the idea of giving away your money and that that might bring joy seems very strange. Let me introduce you then to the Marie Kondo method of giving, giving that sparks joy. Or maybe we should call it the Apostle Paul method, joy in generosity. So in his second letter to the Corinthian Christians, Paul writes about the collection for the poor Jewish believers in Judea. And his first motivation for giving is the example of the Christians in Macedonia. So he says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. See, the example of the Christians in Macedonia is an encouragement to the Corinthian Christians. Even in times of trouble and poverty, the Christians in Macedonia gave generously, even more generously than they were able. There's a sense of competitiveness here. Paul wants the Corinthian Christians to compare themselves to the Macedonians, a kind of godly competitiveness. Verse 8, he says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. But even more than the example of the Macedonians is the example of Jesus himself. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The cost of our generosity is nothing compared to the cost of Christ's generosity. 
He made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. Jesus bore the cost. He bore the great cost of our forgiveness. Through his poverty, we become rich. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is the great motivation for our generosity. Because the gospel reminds us that God in Jesus has been unimaginably generous to us. And so Paul writes to the Corinthians, confident of their generosity. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. You notice it's important to Paul that this is not something commanded, but something that's offered freely. Their giving is not to be given grudgingly, but generously. And as we read on, what becomes clear is that Paul is focused on their hearts. That's his priority, rather than the value of the offering itself. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, he says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, Paul is concerned for their hearts. There are three things that are to mark their giving. It's to be free and planned and cheerful. First, free. This is not compulsory giving. Each of them is to decide themselves what they're going to give. They are free to give as they see fit. Their giving is to be free, not compelled. Second, it's planned. They're not to wait till the collection is taken up and then just give whatever coin they find. This is something to be planned, something to be thought through. Their giving is planned. And third, it's cheerful. God loves a cheerful giver, Paul says. But what if they just don't feel cheerful about it? How can they feel cheerful about giving? I think the first two things about giving help with the third. Their giving will be cheerful because it is free and because it is planned. There's no compulsory giving, there's no impulsive giving that they later regret. They freely decide in advance and so they can be cheerful about whatever they give. Finally, Paul reminds them of the grace of God that enables their generosity. He sees that the generosity of the Corinthian Christians will lead others to give thanks to God. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 14. He says, And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Do you see who benefits from their generosity? Everyone. The recipients of their generosity benefit. Others who see their generosity benefit and praise God. And the Corinthians themselves benefit as they supply the needs of others. You see, as Paul finishes, verse 15, he says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And the gift he means, surely, is the, the gift that Jesus Christ is to all of us. But also, I think, the gift of giving. The Corinthians have the privilege and pleasure of participating in this act of generosity. And so the gift they give is a gift to the recipients, to those watching, and to the Corinthians themselves. Do you find joy in generosity? Sometimes finding joy in generosity might take effort. Last week we heard Jesus' challenging words, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember, your heart 
follows your treasure. So if your treasure is in heaven, then your heart is there too. That's what you desire. It's what you hope for, plan for, work for. Our challenge is to use our earthly treasure for heavenly purposes. Your heart follows your money. This is gospel generosity principle two. Your heart follows your money. If you spend your money on yourself, then that's where your heart will be. But if you start to reorder your priorities and spend your money not only on your own pleasure or your own financial security, but on the work of the kingdom of God, soon your heart will be there. Your heart follows your money. We will find joy in generosity when we've done the work of reordering our priorities, finding treasure in heaven. It's fair to say that money is still one of those taboo topics. It's a bit awkward. We don't really like talking about it. Uh, it's easy to cause offence. But Jesus doesn't mind talking about money. The Apostle Paul isn't shy about it either. Uh, come with me to Philippians chapter 4 and listen to Paul's attitude to money. Philippians 4 verse 10. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. He's thankful, you see, for the contribution from the Philippian Christians, for their financial support. He's thankful, but he's not fixated on it. He goes on in verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So he's not fixated on money. He thanks them for their contribution. It's been a cause of rejoicing for him. But he doesn't raise the matter because he's asking for more money. He's content. He's learned whatever the circumstances he's in to be content. And we know from the Apostle Paul's life that he went through some very hard times. He outlines some of them in verse 12. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, when it comes to verse 13, right at the end there, we sometimes read that verse by itself without looking at the surrounding context. I can do all this or all things through him who gives me strength. But here what Paul's getting at is his ability to be content. How can he be content even when he's hungry or in need? Well, through God who gives him strength. Paul's concern is not that the Philippians give so that his needs can be met. His concern is for them, that they grow in godliness. Listen to verse 17. He says, Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Or another Bible translation, the ESV says, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. You see, he's not worried about his own needs. He's content. He trusts God to provide for him. But what he wants is their growth in godliness. He wants them to be giving because if they're giving, that shows their spiritual growth. You see, giving is a sign of spiritual growth. It's been said that the hip pocket is the last part of us to be converted. Um, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, of course, because you can't be partly converted. But it's true that growth in godliness is not neat and tidy. Often the godliness of giving can be a blind spot for us. Imagine your life is like a house. When you become a Christian, when you believe in Jesus, God moves into the house and he starts to renovate your life. But it's not all renovated at once. God renovates our lives one room at a time. As God works in us by his spirit through his word, gradual change takes place. Here's the thing. 
Growing in godliness means letting God into every room. It might start with God working in the how I speak room. So as God renovates me, I'm less likely to speak with anger. I'm less likely to gossip. I'm more likely to encourage others and speak lovingly. Another room might be the how I spend my time room. So no longer will I use so much time for myself and my hobbies. I'll be growing in spending my time in service of others. What about the how I spend my money room? Has God started to renovate that room for you? The difficult thing is, I, th I think I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have my money, I can accumulate money for my own purposes and serve God as well. But remember, we heard last week, Jesus says, we have to choose. Matthew 6 verse 24, you cannot serve both God and money. We think we can have our cake and eat it too. That I can spend my life making as much money as, much money as I can for my own security or pleasure or ambition and serve God as well. And Jesus says... You cannot serve both God and money. We have to choose. Have you let God into every room in your house? It's unusual these days to get a personal letter in the mail. We might get plenty of bills and advertising material, uh, but personal letters are few and far between, which makes them all the more special when they do come. And for the Christians in Philippi, I imagine receiving a letter from the Apostle Paul was pretty special. One of the lovely things about Paul's pastoral letters is that they are so personal. They're warm. Paul writes with such love. And in the letter to the Philippians, it's clear that he values their partnership in the gospel. He sees the Philippian Christians and their financial support as a vital part of his gospel work. They're his partners in gospel work. In Philippians 1 verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. You see, as they share with him financially, they share with him in the gospel going out. They are partners with Paul in his gospel work. And their partnership in the gospel underscores a key thing about our giving. And that is that our giving priority should be gospel work. And let me explain what I mean by that. There are many worthy causes. There are dozens of organisations uh, looking for your support. Anglicare, Tear Fund, Compassion, World Vision, the Kids Cancer Project, all good organisations to support. Our priority should be gospel work. Because if we don't support it, who will? Now, I'm not saying we should uh, be only giving to church or other Christian organisations, but I am saying we give there first. Because if we don't partner in gospel work, who else will? What this looks like for our family is the majority of our giving goes to church and after that we give to some other Christian organisations, to CMS, uh, to AFES uh, that does university ministry, uh, to Anglicare and to some sponsor children through Compassion. Our priority should be gospel giving. When we give to Christian ministry we are partners in that work and we get to share in the joy of seeing the gospel go out. Now, I don't know if you realise this, but it's only um, 56 days till Christmas. The countdown is on. Uh, Christmas puddings and bonbons have well and truly appeared on supermarket shelves. It won't be long before we start to hear Christmas carols on repeat. The countdown is on. As much as we might dislike the commercial interests that promote Christmas, it's nice to have something to look forward to. Uh, if it's not Christmas, then perhaps for you it's a holiday coming up or a family birthday. God's word is clear that we have something else to look forward to. Last week we heard from Isaiah 
and uh, the passage that Jesus stood up and read in the temple, do you remember it? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Remember, we know that creation is good. Uh, there's so much that God generously gives us to enjoy. But although it's good, there's something not quite right about the world. Creation is broken. And the book of Isaiah grapples with the brokenness of the world. And when Jesus comes and he reads that passage from Isaiah, he proclaims himself as the one who came to bring hope to a broken world. He is the solution to the brokenness of the world. Isaiah 65 is all about what we have to look forward to. How God will wrap up history, fix all the broken things and bring joy to his people. Listen to the words from Isaiah. I'll read the passage in full. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labour in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Do you see what God promises for his people? For those who are trusting in Jesus, here are God's promises. No more weeping or crying. No more death. Abundant blessings. No more fruitless labour. Blessed by God. God will hear his people. It's very much like the picture of heaven we see in Revelation 21. But what does all this mean for us now? We know the blessings that God has for his people in eternity. How does that change the way we live now? The Christian author Randy Alcorn puts it this way. He says, we live for the line, not for the dot. Imagine eternity as a line stretching out into the future, never ending, no finish. It just keeps going. That's what God has for us. Now picture your life. In relation to the line, it's just a dot. We're here for 80, 90 years, maybe 100. Right now, those 80 or 90 years feels like everything. But in the light of eternity, it's nothing. Live for the line, not for the dot. And that makes a difference to the way we think about generosity. If I'm living for the dot, then I'll hold on to everything I can so I can use it for my own purposes. But if I'm living for the line, that changes everything. That means building up not earthly wealth, but treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven is anything that echoes into eternity. Treasure in heaven is lives changed for Christ. How can I use my money to change lives for Christ. This is when generosity brings joy, when you're living for the line, not for the dot. When you see that your generosity might mean someone comes to Christ, and then 
you get to spend eternity experiencing the joy of that one lost sheep who was found by the good shepherd. We began our series on gospel generosity by noticing God's generosity in creation. And because God is generous, because he gives us everything we need, we can be generous. That's principle one. God's generosity calls for my generosity. Then we heard about God's generosity to us in salvation. Uh, God has been generous to us in Christ, and that's another reason for us to be generous. And Jesus has plenty to say about money. He says we have to choose. Serve God or serve your money. That's principle two. Your heart follows your money. We pursue treasure uh, in heaven, not on earth. And finally, today we've heard that we can find joy in generosity. We live for the line, not for the dot. Does giving spark joy? When we live for the line, not for the dot, it can. I hope what we've seen over the past three weeks is that generosity is life-giving. Giving, being generous, is not supposed to be a negative, hard, rule-based thing. We have the privilege of being generous, just as God is generous. We get to practice gospel generosity, reflecting the goodness of our Heavenly Father. We get to partner in the gospel going out, we get to share the blessings God has given us. All of it points us back to God, who is generous to all in creation. And he's generous beyond what we can comprehend in the Lord Jesus. Let me pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your generous provision for us in creation and in the salvation you've given us in Jesus. Please work in us by your spirit so that we pursue not earthly wealth but treasure in heaven. Help us to have such a clear view of the eternity you've prepared for us that our lives and priorities are changed. Help us to find joy in generosity. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer.